Acharya S. is one of our most controversial interviews because her research and theories put the origins of the world's religions as we know them under a new light. As an archaeologist, historian, and linguist who can speak, read, and interpret a total of 10 languages, Acharya has access to direct interpretation of documents in a myriad of ancient texts. In this interview, she makes a solid case for the position that all religions stem from our connection with one eternal source. Let's go ahead and start with um, the genesis of this entire progression of your work and how you ended up in a position to basically blow everybody else's <laughs> notion of comfortable um, myths and their comfort with their own religions. So let's start from the beginning. So you're asking me... Basically, when did this interest of yours, how did it evolve? I became interested in mythology as a small child. So about three or so, I started studying Greek myths and got into, into, interested in National Geographic magazine, for example, and reading the stories of, uh, well, they, they would try to reconstruct the journeys of people like uh, Odysseus or Ulysses. So, and watching movies like that, Sinbad movies or Ulysses movies, got me very interested in, in these kinds of stories. And although I did not understand the mythology as I do now, and found it a bit mystifying, I was impassioned by the Greek civilization in particular. The Egyptian culture did not interest me that much. It seemed very strange, and it seemed as if, as I was growing up, I, came, I became very inclined towards studying these mythologies of these cultures, and the Egyptians seemed like they already had people crawling all over it, and it was very busy. So I went where, at that time, there was less uh, public interest, which was Greek civilization. And I found it more interesting to the West uh, because it is one of the one of the bases of Western civilization. So I ended up studying there. I was I went there at 14 on a family trip. My father was teaching psychology on a, a uh, warship, and he took the whole family there. And when I saw the Acropolis, or the, the Temple of Zeus uh, in Athens, I that was it. I said, "This is what I want to study." I'd already been interested in Lewis Leakey and anthropology, but I really liked the artifact part of, of um, uh, archa you know, studies of archaic things, uh, uh, rather than anthropology, digging up the bones. So I, then I, I did study it through a high school on my own, uh, and then in college, the first day in college, I was in an art history class that revolved around Greek civilization, and I said, okay, this is what I'm going to major in. What did you major in? And he told me it was Greek classics, and I said, that's it. So the first day of school, I had my major already. So already, my, my direction is set in life. My father was very passionate about Greece, so I knew that I'd, I'd picked up quite a bit of the Greek language. And then, so I studied Greek, uh, Greek civilization, and went my junior year to Greece and spent another six, seven months there. And uh, went, came back and got into a postgraduate program also in Greece and learned quite a bit about that culture. And then after college, I was um, a little bit uh, pathless, and somehow <laughs> I ended up on the West Coast, because I'm from the East Coast originally, ended up in uh, the, the Bodhi Tree Bookstore in Los Angeles, probably where all of this stuff came together, because I remember encountering a book called Forgery in Christianity by Joseph Wheelis, which was one of these plastic bound ca cardboard covers uh, just a real not even a published book you know but those were the ones i would look for because they had the most interesting research from far longer ago i found modern books to be very sanitized and the products of fairly dull thinking really these older books uh, before the world war before world war 2 era about from the late 18th century, the ones in English until that era, were extremely well written. The English was very well well thought out and taught. The education was obviously superior. And so these types of books I started getting into, they one led to the next. But I discovered that there was this whole school of thought that, uh, that said our modern icons, especially Jesus Christ, were as mythical as 
Hercules and Zeus and Athena and Adonis and Thor and all the other gods that <clears throat> we have been taught to almost roundly dismiss because they're well, those are just myths. This is the real thing. Well, I discovered that that's it's no more the real thing than they were, and. Uh, 5,000 years ago, the believers in those, Osiris, Isis, and Egypt, they believed in them as strongly as, as do the fanatics of Christianity, for example, or the fundamentalists of, of Christianity today. Uh, they, the followers of Osiris and Isis had this rich spiritual life with connections with them. They made appearances to them, the same kind of thing, after-death experiences. And uh, so when I encountered all of this, I, I had realized as a child that religion was fairly arbitrary and that it had much to do with where you were born and what era you were born in. So I never really gave it uh, very serious thought other than it was causing trouble all over the world. And it, it's caused even a tremendous amount more trouble since I was a child, which I think calls for a great need for this type of work, which is essentially showing that most of the religious ideologies come from the same place and that we are unified uh, people, that these divisions are artificial, and that we certainly should not be harming each other over um, religious beliefs. So if you could give some background then on the links between the religions and what you discovered uh, along your many years of journeying this path. Um, that has led you to, in essence, a unifying theory about the origins of the religions of the world. Yeah, certainly. The first thing that came in my mind when you were asking about imagery is the uh, Madonna and Child image. It's a, it's a very emotionally evocative picture of, uh, in the Western world, we think of Jesus and the Virgin Mary. The Virgin Mary is holding the babe, uh, sometimes suckling him, sometimes just holding, cradling him. You find that image going back to the Ubaid culture in Sumeria, 5,000, 5th millennium BCE. So that, that imagery is very old and, do, and does have to do with a mother and his god, her god son. In other words, a divine mother of a god, of a god son. It's not just pictures of the common folk. Uh, it is part of, of mythology or their religion. There's a, a many examples of that in the Egyptian religion with Isis. Isis holding the baby Horus, who happens to be a sun god, S-U-N, sun god. And it's, again, it, this is not, so I've, I've heard the argument, although there's just a common way to hold your baby. Well, that, that's true. But it was depicted of gods in the same way it's depicted later in the Christian iconography. So that's one example. The other thing is... May I ask one thing at this point? Yeah. Uh, as you've stated in your work before, many of these were the result of virgin births. Is that correct? Yes, they did consider Isis, for example, was considered a virgin before the Christian era. And the reasons for that are the, the, the moon was said to be the receiver of the sun's light, and a new moon was said to be a virgin moon, and the sun would come into her and brighten her up. That was one reason. Another reason was that on December 25th, which many people today know is not the birth of a historical Jesus Christ, but is the birth of this, the new sun of the year, that uh, when the sun rose on that day, it was backdropped by the constellation of Virgo, so that they said that the, the baby sun was born in the arms of the Virgin. And that was claimed of... Uh, a number of gods, including Mithra, which we can directly trace the uh, the appearance of it of that motif in Christianity, we can directly trace that to Mithraism, but also in the Egyptian mythology with Horus and Isis. Isis is made to say on a temple, "I am the virgin who brings forth the sun." It couldn't be clearer than that. Um, <clears throat> there are other icons, such as the cross and uh, the crucifix, or at least a cruciform, with a person, with uh, generally a male, I suppose, male god figure, with his arms outstretched. Uh, there's actually a female one from, Cypri from Cyprus, predating the Christian era by you know, anywhere from hundreds to a couple thousand years. The cross was extremely sacred in numerous cultures around the world, in places where 
the influence could not have been felt prior to the Colombian contact, say, in uh, Central America or South America. Um, so the crosses and various forms of the cross, the, the Egyptian Ankh was as sacred to the Egyptians as the Catholic cross is to the Catholics. And uh, there, there's a, a, a Christian apologist from the third century who is being ridiculed about Christian beliefs, and he re retorts, well, at least we don't carry our God on a cross like you do. This is rather a strong yeah, evidence. You said that was the third century? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's rather strong evidence that, and then it goes on about how their gods are portrayed as being on crosses, the, or the Roman gods. Crucifixion and Krishna as well, and, and some other well-known, more Eastern deities. The crucifixion also comes up repeatedly? It's, it's the play, the, their, um, their de deaths are depicted in a manner that is somewhat ambiguous. For example, in the Krishna myth, you have him being pinned to a tree in his feet, uh, and then he disappears and is seen ascending and then coming back to life. But the in um, in less orthodox terms, it has been called a crucifixion. And in the same, it's the same archetypical sacred king human sacrifice ritual that was performed thousands and thousands of times all over the planet in almost every culture. You find the god pinned to a tree, and sometimes the trees have crossbars in them. Even in, in ancient India, amongst what they call savages, and they're pretty, pretty savage, they had a, an adjustable cross, and they would tie the, the hand, the thing with the palms and the hands, um, the nails going through the palms is not a very practical way of crucifying someone because they rip. I know this is a gory subject, but it is the basis of the gospel story, so <laughs> you kind of have to talk about it. So they would actually tie their wrists to this crossbar. So you, would, you had what was the son of God, the representative of the sun god, being crucified or put on a cross, and then often stabbed in the side with a sharp object, a spear. In the, in the Odin myth, the mistletoe spear he was stabbed with. Um, those are common themes. In, uh, in Quetzalcoatl's case, Quetzalcoatl is the Mexican sun god too, uh, there's an image of him between, on a cross between two thieves. So that is also another motif. And it all starts coming back to what I call astrotheology, or the worship of nature, astro stars, planets, moon. Um, the thieves are considered the night sky the, that, that steal the light from the sun. So he's crucified between the thieves. Uh, they also can represent the months of Capricorn and Sagittarius, in reverse order, where the sun is losing strength. Actually, it would be um, Scorpio and, and Sagittarius, the two thieves are stealing his, his strength, the sun god's strength. And Sagittarius with the arrow is the, wound, the side wounding, shooting an arrow into the sun. Is that, that lance in the sun or the, the spear in the sun? So the sun is the central theme, you're saying, of virtually all of these what have evolved into religions, modern day religions, but also from some of the more uh, primitive cultures as well. You can date it back, you can date the extreme sun worship back to the beginning of agricultural er era, and it depends again on where you're talking about, because some places it seems 10,000 years ago, but there are places underwater now that surely were agricultural areas, so it could be even longer ago than it's so developed, I would say it goes back further than that. And if you look at, now we're finding star maps in caves, 35,000 year olds in Altamira, Spain, and so forth, um, that a this astrotheology, also involving the, the moon and the stars, goes back tens of thousands of years ago, possibly as far back as Homo sapiens sapiens, you know, the, the anatomically modern man. Uh, because that's what they would observe, and, and it had to, it helped. In the case of the moon, moon worship was also a big central focus, and that, that's why we have goddesses who are, who are moon, the moon, like um, Isis and Ishtar, and even uh, uh, Athena to some degree. They all take on these qualities because these, these objects were so powerful. 
and they needed to be studied to know when to plant and when to harvest. And interestingly, um, we had, I didn't show that, well, I did, no, I didn't show that image, but there's an image we can show of um, the Venus of LaSalle holding the three, uh, a crescent moon with the horn, utopian horn, with 13 marks on it. And the 13 marks are, I think, rightly supposed to be the, the 13 moons of 28 months, 28 days length, that points to women being the first timekeepers because their, their moons corresponded to the moons. Mm -hmm. So that goes back 25,000 or more years. And as, as time goes on, you get much more developed in um, what, what you're trying to do in life and not just going out and hunting and gathering and human beings were not just grunting, they were developing language. There were geniuses among them as there are today uh, I'm sure that they reached advanced states. I have a strong suspicion that they developed a very high culture, uh, at least linguistically. They came to a, a high pinnacle. Maybe that language has um, broken into a thousand and is is not as high anymore. But, <clears throat> for example, with Sanskrit, Sanskrit reached a very high peak, the Vedic li language prior to that. There's no reason if you have 100,000 years of human being, human existence on the planet, and that is the generic orthodox time frame now. There's no reason they couldn't have reached that private previously. And with that kind of advanced culture also comes advanced storytelling, and if you're trying to pass along, and we don't know about the writing, but if you're trying to pass along stories that are quite crucial to your life that have to do with nature, you're going to tell a story about them. That's why they personified these entities. And eventually, because the information was so critical, it became part of what, what are called the mysteries. And this is why the masses don't know it today, and this is why the masses back then were a bit befuddled as to what exactly they really were worshipping. So let's go then, <laughs> and not to interrupt you there, but let's take it from there for, uh, forward. Your, your slides that I, I saw earlier today depict virtually every known religion in some way interfacing with a deity of the sun, including the Christian religion. Yes. Sources, I believe, from Ireland and yeah. within Europe, where the monks are worshipping the, the sun, or in another visual, the hand of God reaching out of the sun, mm -hmm. sun down to Jesus Christ. Um, can you take this forward into how this evolved into and why this evolved into what are now known as the world's great religions. How did this happen sure. and become associated with specific men in each case? Mm -hmm. Well, these the mysteries are the key to to the connection of all of these religions. When you get into the st studying the mysteries, you find out that they have this central character who is the great architect of the cosmos, a great mason, a great smith, a great carpenter great physician, uh, and that those are all epithets of the sun. The, one of the main mysteries experiences is to have a blinding light knock you out of your body, set you into ecstasy, you have seen the light, and um, he is the light that every, the, every eye can see in the whole world. You know. uh, so this already existed the solar worship was was evident to people in their festivals such as Easter and at Christmas. Uh, even the solstices might have been evident to the people at large. But in the mysteries, they would go into greater details about the stories. They developed very specific things. For example, the the, the cock, Peter, who, who denies Christ three times, <clears throat> is Peter. The cock is the the cock crowing in the morning. The cock crows three times before the sun comes up. He's the gatekeeper. Uh, this was a, a motif discovered. People, oh, the cock has crowed three times. The sun's about to come up. So um, they, what happens is you had, around the Roman Empire at the time when Christianity was being created, you had all of these themes going around, all these different gods and goddesses, and many of them had taken on solar attributes. The king of kings, god of gods, son of righteousness and so forth, all these attributes that were 
uh, Osiris held just about everyone imaginable. He was so powerful. He had every every god, every priest who had come up with a name for a god or the god had put it. They'd taken it and put it on Osiris. And so, so you see that um, you have these very powerful gods. Now, if you were trying to unify an empire, it had been done many times before. You have a couple of options. One is the people will willingly go along with the religion that you impose, but it is religion that's going to do it. You can try a political system, but the people, if they have religious infighting, the, the political system will probably fall apart. So what they would normally do, and what this is shown throughout the Old Testament, actually, when they're trying to unify the tribes there, uh, you, well, whoever's got the might at the time will then impose his god. Normally it was a male god. There were some very bloodthirsty periods with the with the female gods, goddesses too, but uh, let's say Yahweh, the, the biblical god. He was a local tribal volcano god, and his group of followers were happened to be, you know, nastier, more vicious, more powerful physically, sneakier. They went, they took over a town, a village, they decimated it, and then they imposed Yahweh, and they would demote the god, the local god. Uh, if they wanted to incorporate the people into their tribe so that they would make be bigger and bigger and bigger, which you kind of have to do for survival's sake when you get into that period of history, then they would demote the, uh, the god into a patriarch or a demigod or an angel, something like that. And this had happened many, many times. This was quite common. This is what you did. Your god, your god becomes underneath my god somehow. He's sitting at my right hand. My god is higher than yours. That's that's um, that's how we take over and amalgamate. And so in in Rome at the time, they had not only this long practice in the priesthood of doing that, merging and amalgamating gods. Uh, they had just done one in the Greek god Serapis. Just not just a couple of centuries before, trying to unite the Greco-Egyptian civilization, which included uh, at least a million Jews. So we had those three major factors: the Greeks, the Egyptians, and the Jews, trying to be reunited under a, a single god. So the priests came up with uh, Serapis, who appealed to the Greeks and the Jews because they were still doing uh, animal sacrifice. And he was also a healing god with long curly hair and a long beard, and it looked exactly like the image we have of Christ today for the most part. And he became a very strong, powerful god because the state was behind his creation and um, survived and thrived. And, and part of the, uh, library in Alexand the, the, the Library of Alexandria was placed in the Serapeum for safekeeping until the fourth century and Christian fanatics went wild and tore the place down and destroyed it. And so that was the end of Serapis. But prior to that, then they had the powers that be, and these people were very powerful. They had a lot of money, the people who were in charge of the scriptures of the time, including the Jewish scriptures, in charge of the library, in charge of the learning and the education, extremely powerful, very wealthy. The, the Jewish creators of Christianity, uh, mm, there's, two major factions there, the Samaritans, who are the northern kingdom people, the Israelites, and the Jews, or Judeans. The northern kingdom people had uh, the most amount of money, they were extremely wealthy, so they had a large influence on what was how Judaism was going to go. And it is my contention that they are the ones who took it in the direction of Christianity, whereas the Judeans took it to Pharisaic rabbinical Judaism. Uh, so if you have, you're, you're waiting for a messiah, your country's destroyed, that messiah doesn't come, all around you you've got sun-worshipping people who have a gazillion gods that are always more powerful than yours, they have many more attributes, they're someone you can relate to too because they have a physical form, whereas Yahweh is, is you know, and no idol, the tree is allowed, so there's no physical form. The women especially were not interested in, in the aloof god, they really wanted someone they could relate to. So you, you take a lead and say, well, we've got to bring this God down to earth so people can relate to him. And, um, and, and they, they knew that from prior experiences with Mithra. Mithra was too aloof. Mithra didn't include women. And women were, in, in uh, the days of the cynics, they may, were made fun of as being the gullible women that you could you know, hoist, foist anything upon. So <laughs> women were important to continue or to 
to um, create a new religion. And and they loved this, you know, this God they could weep for. They had the God they could weep for with the dying and resurrecting Savior gods of the Middle East. Tammuz is mentioned in Ezekiel in the Bible. Thomas. Thomas, who becomes Thomas. Um, they cry and mourn for him and t tear their hair. And this is a very big role for women in the Middle East. And so when you remove that factor, then they have nothing to do. They get bored. They're going to find some other god <laughs> or develop their own. <laughs> so so uh, uh, we're going from this central theme that has shown up through the sun gods now um, down to where the legends started t becoming manifest and now being utilized for political purposes, so to speak. Can we take one specific incident of Akhenaten, for example, in trying to th overthrow the notion of many gods into more the understanding or respect or worship for a solo sun god? What happened in that period, and what was that? What was, what, what was he trying yeah, to do? Yeah, um, that's... It that? was very direct. 2000 B.C.? Uh, about... I think it was about... Uh, it was before Moses. Yeah, I think it was about... 1300 BC, something 1500, like that. Yeah, because Moses is 1340. Right, exactly. Uh, well, what happens there is in in Egyptology you already have a what I call polytheistic monotheism, where there's a, an overarching divine power, but many manifestations of him or her. Um, kind of the same system with Yahweh and the angels and archangels and saints and so forth. So, what? What Akhenaten tried to do was just have him focus singularly on the sun disk and not all those adjuncts. And and the priests of the other religions weren't buying it because it takes their occupation away, <laughs> which is exactly how it happens today. You know, you gotta, if, you, if you don't let these other people in by making their gods into demigods or or saints or something, they, they'll they either rebel or they'll take over your operation or you'll have to chase them out of town or something. They don't give up easily, and priesthoods are not going to give up easily. So they basically conspired to, well, we got to get rid of him. If there's, if, there, the, if there's one God and there's only one person who has a key to that God and there's only a central location, then you've just wiped out a whole bunch of occupations for a lot of people. And, and the priesthood has been a very desirable occupation because it effectively allows the person to avoid all manual labor, which almost everyone had to get engaged in, in manual labor, the, except for the priests. You know, they didn't necessarily live well; they could live very poorly, and some of them within a monastery would be carrying water and chopping wood and so forth. But if you get into a city situation, you see them strolling down the street with their gold necklaces and. They're not doing anything hard. So, well, this makes sense. <laughs> You're not on the rock pile. Um, <laughs> going back, going back to that one point again. What could have been the thinking, knowing that this was not going to be viewed in a popular way? What could have been the thinking or the reason at this time for Akhenaten to try to go direct? Say, you are in relationship to the sun. What was going on there? Well, it's hard for me to say because it doesn't seem very different than what the majority of people were doing in other places. They were quite go sit up on a mountain and commune with nature was, was the way to do it. Um, I, th I think the, when times, when there were troubles, and I do believe there was some, some political chaos going on in e Egypt at the time, then then you go to someone who must, go to the shaman, he's going to shake his gourd around and he'll make something better happen than what I can do on my own. So now if we're looking at... Um the way that these stories are told, and we'll now focus on Christianity at this point, and uh, the biblical renditions of Jesus dying on the cross, crucifixion, virgin birth, etc. You mentioned that there was n there was no mention of any crucifixion until roughly um, six centuries after the event, or the reported event. So how does this become taken as fact? Well, the crucifixion is in the texts uh, of the second century, which is, I claim, the biblical texts are from the second century. However, it was not depicted. He was not depicted on a cross. That was not a central icon to the, to the story. In fact, the early apologists are 
um, apologetic about why God could be killed in the first place, and they try to avoid this imagery and saying that we do not worship a criminal and his cross. You, on the other hand, have crosses on your standards with men on them and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> but that iconography was not until the 6th century, so we have other gods depicted on crosses prior to that. At some point, as in any other, as in the rest, as they're amalgamating, they'll find probably a pocket of people who are fervid cross worshippers, and they, maybe they're Dionysian follower, Dionysus followers, and so then the priest, a priest, will sit down and look. Our God was on a cross too, and here's an image. Take this one instead, and this is how it came to be usurped. So, what about the actual entity that? is known as Jesus, if you look into the work, say, of Lawrence Gardner, Bloodline of the Holy Grail, says, yes, the entity existed, this person did exist, but it wasn't exactly the way the story is rendered in the Bible. But rather, but rather these were more titles. Even jo the name Joseph, for example, for example, more of a title. Um, the Messiahs, there were many, it was more of a title or a job description. How do you fit the, in essence, the dismissal of the individuals in with that. Well, the word Christ, Christos, is in the Old Testament. It's used dozens of times in reference to a number of people, including Cyrus, the, uh, the, the Babylonian king who was in charge, or the Persian who was in charge of uh, Babylon during the so-called exile. Um, the Jews then believed that he was the Christos, he was the Messiah, uh, sa Savior and Messiah. <clears throat> and the name Jesus also was used about 300 times in, in reference to any person named Joshua there when the scriptures were translated into the Greek. So we did have, we have a Jesus the Christ in Joshua, the old patriarch, prior to the Christian era. There were Joshua, Joshua worshippers, they set up temples to him um, that who believed that he had brought the Jews into the promised land and that he would come back again and do it again. So they were waiting for Joshua, Jesus, the Messiah, Christ, to come back again. And so immediately you're in suspicious territory because, wow, all of a sudden he shows up and yet nobody, none of the historians see him. So there were certainly people... I'm, I'm, say, I'm not saying Joshua was a real person either. Joshua was also a sun god. but uh, And uh, one of the gods that was usurped by the Yahweh cults in order to make a bigger unified territory uh, was the, were the Joshua followers. So, But you already had prior to the Christian era some, these people worshipping Jesus both in Judaism and in uh, paganism with the epithet IES or Jason. Uh, Asclepius was named yet. IES, Dionysus was named IES, which is basically Jesus, the name Jesus. So uh, there, there doesn't become any reason for a real person. The earliest um, Gnostic text with their Docet Docetism, which says that the god of the cosmos cannot become human or uh, cannot take form of, in matter, you had that going on. Uh, there's really no reason to look for a person other than somebody started saying, hey, yeah, that was a real person, and they lived here and there and there. In other words, the Jews who were writing it or the Israelites uh, were likely, well, the ones who were writing it were certainly aware that this was allegory that they were placing in a different era because they made a tremendous amount of mistakes when they were putting it into that, that era. They did not know the history at the time. It's, you can tell it's distanced from then from when it supposedly happened, which is the first century. You can see that it was written by somebody who didn't live there. Um, people will be able to find anything they want in there. You have that whole Holy Blood, Holy Grail thing going on, but yet prior to the advent of Christianity in the British Isles, there already was a Holy Grail cup. It was quite common, and it, it had to do with the uterus and the menstrual cycle, the menses, um, in goddess-worshipping cultures, or just both, you know, having both genders. So there isn't really anything original there either to trace, trace some guy to. 
I suppose what I'm wondering, is it possible that, that it's almost as though we're talking about a God overlay to perhaps people who were very real of the time, it's just that they're being attributed with God-like status because maybe they were socially um, far up the scale or in terms of their education or maybe even having belonged to mystical societies and were part of the hierarchy of those that were in essence creating the needs for religion of that time. So is it possible some of these people actually did exist, but just not as, quote, known as now the son of God? N no, not, not the major characters, not the big guys like Krishna, Christ, Buddha, Osiris, Her Hercules, Thor, Zeus. No, that, those, are, those are myths. The, this, um, this battle has taken on at least three perspectives. One is people who just who believe that they're wholly true and they happened in real life and everything is, is um, true about them, including the divinity of the God and so forth. The second one is people who have thought, well, there was somebody there who existed and then they attached a bunch of fairy tales and myths to their story. And then the third perspective is that they are mythical entities from, from the beginning. And we, to account for them, we have to say that the people who created the story took myths and put them into into uh, history, forced them into history. There are examples of of uh, both of the two last ones. I couldn't claim examples of the first one that would make me a believer of some religion, but the, the second one, sure. Things like Alexandria, uh, Alexander the Great had, had uh, superhuman attributes at times put on his story, and many rulers had, but see, this is where it where you get into really investigating it very in, in depth to figure out, okay, is this, well, that's called evamorism, is where you take a person and attribute all kinds of fairy tales and myths to his or her mundane, rea mundane biography. That's where you have to get in there with a microscope and figure out, is there any core to this onion once you start peeling away the mythical accretions? Uh, the Jesus Seminar people throwing out all of the, the myths and many of the sayings that they had discovered to have been found in other cultures and not original to to Jesus. They came up with the cynic sage who wandered about and said a few things. But then you can go even further and say, well, but those sayings are not, those sayings are not original either. And you can trace those, those sayings somewhere else in the um, prior, prior to the Christian era. So you, you really end up with an amalgam of, there's no ways about it, it's an amalgam of let's say 20 characters and Gerald Massey once said a composite of 20 people is no one. So you know, <laughs> even if you could find someone to point to, it, that starts to fall away. Now as, as concerns some, somebody like uh, Paul who probably of all the Christians in the New Testament Paul probably has the most historicity. However, he does not appear in history anywhere, even though he claims he caused all this trouble among the Jews and, and Josephus was near, nearby and doesn't record any of these um, military movements where he went in and killed a bunch of people and that's nowhere to be found in history. And you'd think that, I mean, Jewish people are pretty upset if you go in and kill them en masse, they would record it somewhere, but they don't talk about Paul at all. Um, and then you find out that, well, isn't it strange that Paul's journeys take him to brotherhood strongholds? Um, this brotherhood, you could call it uh, Masonic, you can call it, it tends to be Masonic because they would build with stone and stone lasts the longest. But they're also, like I said, carpenter gods and smith gods. Uh, but this, there's a brotherhood that's traceable. The Essenes are a branch of it. They're not the whole thing. There's a brotherhood that's traceable from Britain to India, and they are not completely closely knit. They're in competition, but they are, they do have connections so they can give each other signals and get in, into each other's inner sanctums and then learn their secrets. These sites that Paul is addressing in the New Testament epistles, Ephesus, Galatia, um, Corinth, and so on, these all had very powerful brotherhood seats there. And oddly enough, before him, this person named Apollonius of Tyana went to the same places. He included Samothrace on his itinerary, which is also a huge seat of the mysteries, the Samothracian mysteries. 
and he goes in the opposite direction. So it's almost as if they took Apollonius of Tyana's travels, did it in the opposite direction, and attached Paul's name to it. So I think part of the basis of Paul, for example, is Apollonius of Tyana. Um, some claim that he called himself Paul, P-O-L, Apollonius Paul. And then, interestingly enough, five centuries before that, Orpheus went to the exact same places, <laughs> proselytizing the great god Dionysus, who was our savior, Lord and Savior, who died and was resurrected, and who went by the moniker IES. So, so are you saying that the, these geographical locations or edifices that these characters throughout history migrated to were all, um, in essence, the mystery school strongholds? And are you saying that these same individuals would be the puppeteers that create the needs for the legends, religions, etc.? Yeah, or they had the hierarchy in the mystery schools make up, for example, in the case of Orpheus. Orpheus became this very powerful figure who does not appear in history, but is is like a um, code word for uh, an initiate. You know, the Mormons go out for two years and they go on their missions. Well. An initiate would have to go play Orpheus, say. It's your time to go to, to go be Orpheus, and and it seems to it seems also that they had these basic letters, where they would address the group that they went to, the particular brotherhood they went to, and that these letters became accreted, interpolated, and eventually they became the Pauline epistles. Um, when they get into specific. You can you can read some of the you, there's mystery school language in these in the epistles like crazy and particularly Masonic. I have some writings on that where I go into a lot of the Masonic um, symbols in especially in. Oh, those good! I want to show you one epistles. later and ask you what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's one of their primary ones. I'm curious about. Yes. Mm. So you're saying the uh, uh, if I'm understanding you that the lineage of these mystery schools or these these orders dates how far back then? Where do they start appearing where all these others start in essence uh, migrating to these places throughout the historical texts? No, that's a good question. We have a discussion, a legend in the 8th century of uh, Numa Pomphilus, if you could pronounce it who was the king of Italy at the time. And the legend has has the establishment of colleg collegia attributed to him, colleges, that were essentially what we think of as Masonic lodges. Uh, but they had every craft I involved in them. Anything that was necessary, forging, forging weapons, very important, uh, making wheels, carpentry, of course, smithcraft. Masonry was the choice for gods and pharaohs and kings who wanted to last forever. Um, so these, these were set up to foster the, the actual crafts and arts, but they also had a whole initiation set structure with levels, and you, you start off as a peon and have a certain experience, and it was pretty de rigueur. And, in, in there, and it's kind of the way it is today. If you want to really get somewhere in a particular business, you have to join the Elks or the Masons. Or so this was, in essence, a, a political. But it was also religious. Sorts and religious, but it had political overtones in, t in terms of what the thinking of the day was going to become, etc. Who yes. would be followed and worshipped. And Mithra, for example, became very popular uh, within burial organizations. I suppose that's because he, his thing is rock born caves. There's a lot of underground motifs. There's a Eucharist and Last Supper. There, in other words, there's some sort of rites and rituals that help the dead move along. So uh, burial associations, it was a burial guild. And then that could be traced back though to very primitive times where you find relics in caves that are mm -hmm. clearly placed there in a ritual ceremony in order to facilitate the spirit's passing. And from there you could you could really probably find artifacts around the world that would just start accumulating the evidence of what I'm talking about to the point where it became such a complex, complex and effective 
ideology to, to gather so many different cultures and people together. Although they did fight like crazy um, mm -hmm. to, to keep, in Europe for example, the Lithuanians were the last stronghold of paganism. They fought Christianity off until the 14th century. And in other words, n people didn't just roll down, rolled over and say, hey, that's a great idea. I think I'll give up the worship of my ancestors and convert tomorrow. Uh, you say I get what? There was nothing new that they would be getting in return anyway. And some of them were quite indignant. The Nordics, for example, who are you know, fairly fiery people, uh, said, you're telling me that my ancestors are all in hell because they worshipped my gods? Uh, but, you know, by God, you're wrong, and get out of here before I chop mm -hmm. your head off, is what their response mm -hmm. was. Well, isn't that sort of the response people are having to you today, <laughs> <laughs> as the one delivering this information? <laughs> yeah, although I'm not, I'm not trying to convert them to my God. <laughs> but, yeah, I do have that response. I also have responses that mitigate that very nicely. People tell me, oh, thank you so much for freeing me from this, uh, helping me free myself from this iron, erroneous ideology that has caused me nothing but grief from childhood. <laughs> I had an elderly couple tell me that they could die in peace now, and uh, they were pretty close to it when they wrote to me, so I, don't, I haven't heard from them, but uh, they had read my book three times each. Uh, the first, Which book are you the speaking The first of? book, The Christ Conspiracy, The Greatest Story Ever Sold. They'd read that three times each, and they said it had removed the fear and guilt and shame of being alive and they could pass now without being terrified that something on the other side was going to get them. Or Is that part of what you're trying to do with this, other than uh, purely exposing it from an academic viewpoint? I did have a philanthropic motivation to begin with. That, that one was a pleasant surprise. I maybe had considered that, except that other people had told me, hey, you don't want to do this to older people. You give them a heart attack and they'll die. And <laughs> it turns out, well, actually, no, maybe they'll live longer because they're not, they're not consumed with this uh, torment. But, yeah, one of the things when I uncovered, started uncovering this stuff, I, I thought to myself, first of all, okay, why you? And then it dawned on me, well, all right, I'm an archaeologist. I can make my way through a variety of languages, which is what it takes, really. You have to be able to learn things on the spot, linguistically. Speaking <coughs> of linguistics, how many languages do you speak, or can you at least decipher? Yeah, I can, I can mostly read. I, I'm a little rusty on most of them speaking, although modern Greek I'm pretty good at. Um, Greek, modern, and ancient, uh, and then Latin, I can read a little bit. Uh, French, I read very well. Spanish. Italian, I can read. Uh, German, I can do okay. I tend to have to have a dictionary, especially German. Um, <laughs> so in other words, you can find your way around a variety of ancient documents with just, relative ease. Yeah, Sanskrit, Hebrew. If I, if I have my source tools with me, I can make my way through those. Um, yeah, I mean, if I need to. I, on the spot, I've had to learn several words in Sanskrit, I'd say quite a few words in Sanskrit, and to recognize them, uh, and Hebrew as well, I've had to. Those are not easy languages, really, particularly. Um, so this is why you, in part. Yeah, because I had that capacity already, and archaeologists do tend to have the ability to be able to read languages, they have to do that. But the other thing was, too, that I had, growing up, a very strong empathy for all life, and I, and I used to become very sickened by the divisiveness, and particularly of religion. I could see it as a child. I said, yeah, what are these people believing in this stuff? It just makes them all angry and want to hurt each other. And, and they certainly do. It, it, it prevents people from getting to know how nice another person really could be. If, if you and I were sitting here and, I had, and you had your mumbo-jumbo stuff on that was clearly saying to me, my belief is superior to yours, you've immediately shot down any chance that we could have a real civil conversation because I'm getting an air of arrogance and, and superiority from you. <laughs> and, right. and, and you're obviously not open to hearing anything I have to say. So you, you, you could find out that, hey, I'm actually a pretty nice person and we get along and have some fun. But fun does not seem to be the, the, um, the push for in behind religion. It, you know, it's not fun. You know, it's to be made a robot, to, to recite rote and 
everybody seems it seems to be about suffering and so forth. So <clears throat> when I encounter other people who have this uh, self um, self willed motivation, self motivation to do to to get their their passion and vision out there, I think to myself and I, I'll ask them, why are you doing it? Because uh, you're you're like really nasty. <laughs> <laughs> that this happened to me repeatedly. You're very nasty, and I don't think they're replacing the nasty system you're criticizing with your nasty system is an improvement. <clears throat> if we're trying to uh, ameliorate a problem, can we not focus on making a better life, a better world, a happier place? I had someone criticize me for using my um, for using a pseudonym, and uh, he said, "I said, well, I." I don't want people to associate another uh, name with that. And uh, to me, it's fun. To, uh, what I'm doing is fun. I'm, he said, well, isn't it lying? I said, it's not your real. I said, no, it's not lying. It's, it's fun. I'm having fun with the world. I'm trying to, this information is serious, and it's truthful, and it's factual. <clears throat> but if people aren't getting, having fun with it or feeling better about themselves, then that's not, you know, I mean, that's my purpose, really, is to have people think to themselves, oh, I don't have to hate my neighbor. I don't have to think of my family and friends as being sinners who are going to hell. <laughs> so it's really about creating a freedom of spirit. Freedom, exactly. I don't, I don't, um, somebody said I had something to do with hardcore atheists, and someone else wrote that they had become an atheist since reading my works, and I, I said, well, that's not my goal. Uh, <clears throat> you can be an atheist or you can not be an atheist. My, I, I firmly believe that the human mind has the capacity to be theist, atheist, polytheistic, monotheistic, henotheistic, deist, all at once. That there's... That, that uh, we should have that freedom of thinking, of thought, freedom of spirit and thought. Mm -hmm. That we are our own beings, our autonomous beings who you know, if somebody doesn't muck up our lives, can actually live pretty nicely. Well, and none of us can live <clears throat> without the sun. <laughs> it comes right, right back to it, the one thing I suppose that <laughs> really does, it really is the deciding factor on uh, regarding life here is the sun, and appropriately so, the name of your most recent book is The Sons of God, S-U-N-S, -S, Sons of God. Thank Krishna, is, Buddha, and Christ Unveiled. Yes, this is, is fascinating work. And um, I would like to have, just in case the viewer detected a teensy-weensy bit of snoring, if you just mm -hmm. want to tilt the camera down a little bit. <laughs> and this is little Jason. Is there <laughs> return. some symbolism? <laughs> yeah, is Jason returned. Is there some symbolism behind that one? Jason and the Argonauts. There yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Jason was a solar myth. Well... <laughs> Right now, Jason has his little teddy bear, and he's curled up in your lap, and I'll be curious to see 20 years from now what's up with Jason. <laughs>